Passing through the Arctic winter of 1846 and into the spring and summer, Charlotte worked on at her novel, Jane Eyre. Notwithstanding the domestic anxieties that were harassing them, and the failure of the poems, and the fact that the three novels were returned with monotonous regularity from the publishers they sent them to. By early July, their hopes had vanished to nothing. And then a new and rather irresponsible publisher, Thomas Newby of Mortimer Street, offered to publish two of the novels, Emily's and Anne's, if they would contribute 50 pounds to the cost. But not Charlotte's novel, The Professor, that was returned. Charlotte immediately sent it off again, wrapped in the paper it had just come back in to yet another publisher, Smith, Elder and Company. When no acknowledgement came, Emily and Anne began to have pangs of conscience for letting their novels be published without Charlotte's. And after two weeks of waiting, Charlotte wrote off to ask whether the manuscript had been safely received. Here's Mr. Feather coming with the post. He's not carrying well, parcels, so there's still some hope for Charlotte. Thank you. Nice and bright again. Yes, it is indeed. What is it, Charlotte? Is there news? It's from Smith and Elder. They declined to publish it. Oh, Charlotte. Look, they've written two pages discussing it in such a considerate way. And they say that a work in three volumes would meet with careful attention. And you have one almost ready. So very nearly ready. You're trembling now. And I believe it answers some of these doubts about the professor. I can finish it within a month, I'm sure. I'll write and tell them so. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, did you give Smith the manuscript by that fellow Bell? Yes, he took it home with him on Saturday. I'm glad you backed me up. He thinks you're more clear-headed than I am. He laughed when you read my report. You seem to be so enchanted, he said. I don't know how to believe you. It's extraordinary. After all these years as a reader, that the manuscript can keep me up half the night to finish it. I can't visualize the man at all, can you? I can usually get some sort of notion, but... I know. It is rather mysterious. And his address, care of some spinster lady or other. At a parsonage, you said. Mm. It's not the sort of book you think she'd appreciate if he let her read it. And yet the odd thing is, you see, his letters have a style and a hand that's quite uh, feminine. Good morning, Williams. Good morning, morning, Taylor. Sorry to be so late this morning. We were just talking about that novel you took home with you. Did you have time to have a look at it? I began it at breakfast. I didn't stop for luncheon. I had a glass of wine and a sandwich while I read. Cancelled an afternoon's engagement to go riding in the country. Upset my mother by cramming down my dinner in no time. I didn't go to bed till the thing was finished. Well... Oh, my dear fellow, what do you mean? I should think we could reckon on a publication date in October. The book was set up, the proofs corrected, and Jane Eyre came out on October the 16th. The reviews were cautious at first, but the power and fascination of the tale itself made its merits known to the public without the finger posts of professional criticism. And early in December, the rush began for copies. I just heard a very awkward conversation between Papa and James Feather. Why, what was it? Well, I saw him coming with a post and I was hurrying downstairs just as Papa was leaving the house. Feather asked him whether a Mr. Carabell was visiting here or staying in the district. Papa said he knew no one of that name. Luckily, he hurried on then before Feather could say any more and I rescued the letters. Tabby's getting inquisitive too. It will have to come out. Yes, I know. The 
silence is turning to double dealing. I'll confess it to him this very afternoon before I weaken. I'm writing a book. Have you a ledger? Yes, and I want you to read it. I'm afraid your handwriting will try my eyes too much. But it is not in manuscript. It is printed. But my dear, you haven't thought of the expense. It should be almost sure to be a loss, for how can you get a book sold in sufficient numbers? No one knows your name. But Papa, I don't think it will be a loss. And no more will you if you'll just let me read you a review or two. The book is called Jane Eyre. And this is what the Times newspaper has to say. Jane Eyre is a remarkable production. Freshness and originality, truth and passion, singular felicity in the description of natural scenery and in the analysis of human thought enable this tale to stand boldly out from the mass. What will he think? What will he think? He hasn't stirred from his room all day long. Well, most of the time he may have been sleeping. He gets such trouble nights now. I hardly like to give him the work of reading it. Are you nervous? I really think I am. I know I shall be. Ever since Mr. Newby's letter this morning. To think that by tomorrow, Emily and I will have our books in our hands as well. My heart keeps giving a skip and a hop. You have your success to thank for that, Charlotte. You might never have brought them out otherwise. But I wish I could have more faith in your Mr. Newby. Girls, do you know Charlotte has been writing a book? And it is much better than likely? Papa, you have hit it. I'll pour him a cup of tea as a reward. <laughs> <laughs> What can I do? What can I do? It won't let me get away from it. This dragon in my mind. Dragon agony. No! I can't get away from it in words. It's worst at night, when there's no life about. Quieten yourself. I am here with you. Don't persecute yourself like this. In the light it's easier. Short times, in cheerful company. Till the bitter truth blazes back through the brain. And then the bullet would be welcome. Oh, God, I don't know what to do. Uh. Give him the opportunity. Open your heart to him. There's nothing there. I've tried. There's nothing but a hollow echo. Or if there's anything, it's hell that's waiting for me. Uh. Branwell, I beg you to listen and believe. We are never cast out for what we truly depend on. Byron had the terrible truth of it. No more, no more, oh, oh, never more on me. God. The freshness of oh, the heart oh, shall fall God like dew. Then we to pray. I tell you, love won't have anything to do Don't with give me. Give us those things whereof our conscience <laughs> is afraid. I beseech thee, bring my son to an understanding. My cock is a twelve at night. That he may find How thee can a I talk to people who think that it's noon?
dear, this is beyond everything. I told you, Anne, you shouldn't have promised your new book to Mr. Newby. Why, what's the matter? He has persuaded a New York publisher that the tenant of Wildfell Hall is by the same pen as Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights, and better than either, that Cara Ellis and Acton Bell are all the same man. And as I've promised my new book to Smith and Elder, they're naturally very upset. They would be glad to be in a position to contradict the statement. Oh, Charlotte, Mr. Smith could never think you would go back on your word. What does he know of me? He's polite but put out. Mr. Newby is a rogue, but rogues have to be born with. Oh, dear. How confusing it all is. People saying that you wrote them all, or I wrote them all, or now that Anne wrote them all. <laughs> we shall have to go up to London and prove to Mr. Smith that we are three people. Not if you took a horsewhip to me. And don't dare to say who I am. Let them babble to their heart's content. Not when they question my good faith. A letter would prove nothing. They must see that Anne and I at least are not one person. Now, if we travel up to London tonight, we can present ourselves at Cornhill in the morning. Tonight, Charlotte? Oh, yes. If we pack a bag now, Billy can take it on his cart when he goes to Keithley, and we can walk over this afternoon in time to catch the train to Leeds. But how shall we sleep? Perhaps we won't. We shall set our minds at rest. Much good may it do you! I hope I haven't let impulse outrun discretion. Now that I'm calmer, I'm beginning to feel apprehensive. You mustn't be. We can't go back now. This wretched storm. I wish you hadn't to spend the night in wet clothes. I shall feel very responsible if you catch cold. Don't worry, Charlotte. Do you think anyone will be at the office on a Saturday morning? Oh, Anne! I hadn't thought. Once begun, we must persevere. That's why I have to go on to the end with the tenant of Wildfell Hall, though I know you wish I wouldn't. I hate to see you wrestling with a task so foreign to your own natural inclination. I'm sorry, but it has to be done, and it almost is. Come in. Excuse me, sir, but there are two ladies, so they must see you. Two ladies? Well, what can they want? Did you ask their names? They wouldn't give their names, Mr. Smith. How very odd. Yeah, rather odd. Small and rather odd. Well, you'd better bring them in. This way, ladies. Good morning, ladies. In what way can I help you? But where did you get this? From the post office. It was addressed to me. We both came, my sister and I, so that you might have ocular proof that there are at least two of us. Am I to understand? No. No. But this is most perplexing. You have me at a disadvantage. We are three sisters. I mean, I am Miss Bronte, who is Carabelle. And this is my sister Anne, who is Acton Bell. God bless my soul. So we have come to the heart of the mystery. Do forgive me if I seem for a moment disbelieving. Miss Bronte, may I take your hand? Miss Anne? You see, neither of us, we, we will. Miss Bronte, please sit down. Here. Uh, Miss Anne, please. We, we, you must understand. Will you be able to stay in London long? Uh, there is much for us to talk about. And there are many people who will be eager to meet you, and, and much, no doubt, you'll want to do yourselves while you're here. I know my mother and my sisters would be delighted if you'll make our home your centre. Oh, you're very kind, but with so much that is new to take in, I think it would be better if we stay quietly at the Chapter Coffee House. Then I shall bring my sisters to call on you this evening, and we shall take you to the opera. It would be delightful, but I, I, I'm not sure. We are used, you know, to such a very uneventful life at the parsonage. Uh, do please excuse me. I must just call Mr. Williams. He will never forgive me if I keep you two to myself. Williams, there's a world of people longing to make your acquaintance. Williams, here, and Acton Bell in the office. 
We hadn't understood that it was settled that we should go to the opera. So when Mr. Smith and his sisters came to call for us, we weren't ready. We thought it best not to make any objections. Though Charlotte had a thunderous headache and had just taken a strong dose of salvolatic. When Mr. Smith walked me up the crimson carpeted staircase of the opera house, I had to smile inwardly. We must have looked such a contrast. He in his white gloves and me in my spectacles. And I whispered to him that we weren't accustomed to this sort of thing. Anne was as calm as ever, but I must confess to feeling a slight clownishness when the fine ladies and gentlemen looked down at me. It was after one o'clock when we got to bed, and we hadn't been in bed at all the night before. You can imagine how tired we were. I don't want to imagine it. Oh. Did you ever see such a jaded wretch? Were those strange lines ploughed into my face when I went away? No, and they'll be gone again tomorrow. We must save the rest. The Royal Academy and the National Gallery for Papa to hear. I wish it were possible to tell Bramwell about it all. To see him light up with interest as he used to. How's he been behaving? Lying on his bed most of the time. Go in and see him, but he may not even seem to hear what you say to him. to London. I thought you might like to hear about it. Bramwell! And so the year 1848 had come in. The year when Emily and Anne had planned to open their secret papers, written on Emily's birthday three years before. I wonder how we shall all be, and where, and how situated on the 30th of July, 1848, when, if we are all alive, Emily will be just 30. I shall be in my 29th year, Charlotte in her 33rd, and Branwell in his 32nd and what changes we shall have seen and known. And shall we be much changed ourselves? We sounded very young then. It's curious that we had no thought that we might have real books to our credit by the time we opened the papers. Shall we write another paper today to open three years from now? No, Anne, I don't think so. I don't think so either. Why, I wonder. It's better not to measure the years passing. We are freer without expectations. Here is Mr. Bronte come to see you, Mr. Grundy. Well, good evening, sir. I thought that... Good evening, uh, Mr. Grundy. You thought to see my son. And indeed you will. Though scarcely as you remember him, I'm afraid. He's very weak and confused and broken in health. I'm sorry to hear that, Mr. Bronte. <clears throat> I left him still in bed, but he was determined to dress himself and come here. Your message had a quite desperate urgency for him, which really alarmed me. I would have invited you up to the house, but I believe that any effort he can make to rouse himself may be of benefit. At least I hope so. Oh, Mr. Grundy, if you can bring any comfort to my unhappy son, I shall be your debtor. I hope I may, Mr. Bronte, sir.
Bronte. It's good to see you. Though I wish you were looking more hearty. Well, it's kind of you to drag yourself out of bed for me. Now, come sit down. some brandy keeping warm by the fire. It really is you, Grundy. What? Well, who else? Here. Have a stiff glass of this. You look as though you could do with it. Coming out of a warm bed into the cold night. Thompson, Leyland and the rest would want to be affectionately remembered to you if they knew I was visiting. Oh, those were great days, my boy. Before the world began to take its toll of us. Here, try some of this excellent ham old Sugden's provided. I'm no eater these days, Frank. My stomach has lost all liking for it. Well, it's time you reminded it what it's missing. Got to keep alive, you know. Why do I have to? It's a misery to me. All the good I saw once in the world and in myself has collapsed in total ruin and my body with it. If I weren't as frightened of dying as I am of living, I'd put an end to it. Look here, I won't have that. We're all too fond of you to let you take that line. Stop tearing yourself apart. Get yourself well. What about that novel you were writing? Writing? Jesus. It's only asking for worse depression. The hopelessness of breaking through the barriers of literary circles, getting a hearing among publishers, is a self mortification I can do without. Here, let me fill your glass. Poor Leyland's having his troubles, too. You know that statue of his, the Five Warriors? Well, Lord Ribblesdale bought it, but it broke to pieces on the way to Gisborne. <laughs> because he can't afford decent materials. To keep his creditors quiet, he's wasting his genius on funeral tablets and such. I, t I tell you what, Grundy, I'd be thankful if you'd go and see Tom Nicholson at the old cock when you're back in Halifax. He's threatening me with a court summons. I've told you, I think, that the beloved lady I can never forget that we're eternally parted he sends me money from time to time through the channels of the family doctor. Well, I've written to Dr. Crosby and asked for an advance. Tell Nicholson it's morally certain I'll get it. If he presses me with the law, I'm ruined. Jay would destroy me forever. Look, I'll deal with old Tom. Don't fret. In return for that, what about eating something? <laughs> well, what's that for? Do you usually keep the kitchen up your sleeve? You see, Frank, I'd given up all hope of ever seeing you again. I didn't believe the message could come from you. I thought... It's more likely to be a call from Satan. You never know 
things seem innocent, but they hide terrible things. I made up my mind to rush in and stab whoever was waiting for me. And in that excited state, I didn't recognize you at first. Till your voice brought me home to myself. Well, now, try and keep St. Paul in your mind in future. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels. Unawares. shouldn't be out, you know. Here, let me give you a hand. He's all done himself, Miss Emily. Let me take him up to his bed. When a September day really tries, there's nothing more comforting. It's like those lines of James Thompson. The radiant sun, how gay, how calm below the gilded earth. Unfolding fair the last autumnal day. Thank goodness the east wind has stopped blowing. Isn't Emily lucky not to mind about it? A dry, uninteresting wind, she calls it. It doesn't affect her nervous system. It does mine. At least I didn't get a cough this time. I'm growing sensible. Has John Brown come to see us? I left the front door open to give the passage the benefit of the sunshine. Morning, Miss Bronte. Miss Anne. Good morning, John. Did you want to see Mr. Bronte? I thought I'd come up and sit with Branwell a bit. Till church time. Oh, thank you. That's what he would like. He's been so much easier in his mind these past few days. I'm sure he must have noticed it. So much gentler and affectionate. All that bitterness seems to have gone. The doctor holds out great hope that if this change in him can be maintained, he can begin to build his strength. Thank you, John. Branwell? Are you sleeping? Thought you might like some company. Pretty comfortable, are you? Thanks. I'm nothing much. Old Dr. Cropper says you're on the mend. <coughs> <coughs> I don't know what there is to mend. Fighting with a lot of shadows. It seemed very real at the time. Was it? Anyway, they've surrendered now, or gone to ground, except that I've done nothing, either great or good. That's something to look forward to. Is the day mild enough? En enough for what? The church door open. I could hear the singing. Leave it open. Oh! What is it, Branny? Ain? John Dang? No, dear man. You'll come through. <laughs> Let me fetch one of your sisters. She will know. Papa! <sighs> Miss Bronte?
Things look bad. Is Mr. Bronte in his study? Yes. Is it Grandma? Come in. He has asked for me. Grandma has asked for me. and relief this thy servant look upon him with the eyes of thy mercy give him comfort and sure confidence in thee that if it should be thy pleasure to prolong his days here on earth he may live to thee and be an instrument of thy glory by serving thee faithfully and by doing good in his generation and keep him in perpetual peace and safety. when the memorial sermon to Branwell was preached. Emily was unwell, but she forced herself to attend the service. As the family came back to the parsonage, the cold September wind cut across the churchyard. Long before, Emily had written in a poem, I could swear that wind had swept the world aside, and the wind had begun the work of taking her world away as she closed the parsonage door behind her for the last time. Never in all her life had Emily lingered over any task that lay before her, and she did not linger now. Charlotte watched her suffering with an anguish of wonder and love. One day, when Emily seemed a little better, Charlotte sought to amuse her sisters by reading what was said about them in the North American Review. It was after the publication of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, and Charlotte later described to me how strangely the critics' view of the authors compared with the truth. And there can be no doubt that Mr. Warner has spoken with extreme disparagement. As I sat between them at our quiet, but now somewhat melancholy fireside, I studied the two ferocious authors. Ellis, the man of uncommon parts, but dogged, brutal, morose, sat leaning back in his easy chair, drawing his impeded breath as best he could, and looking, alas, piteously pale and wasted. It is not his wont to laugh, but he smiled half amused and half in scorn as he listened. Acton was sewing. No emotion ever stirs him to loquacity, so he only smiled too, dropping at the same time a single word of calm amazement to hear his character so darkly portrayed. 
I wonder what the reviewer would have thought of his own sagacity, could he have beheld the pair as I did. Perseveringly as you do to the animals. I wish you would try some of the homeopathic prescription that Mr. Williams recommended. Quackery. How do you know if you won't try it? Doctors. A lot of poisoners. Nature should be left to take her own course. Don't fret me. Well then, you shall rest in a chair while I read to you. I want to know what we shall make of Mr. Emerson's essays that have arrived from Cornhill today. Now, will you do that? Yes. Will you take my arm along the passage? No. I have two legs. Why don't you go up to bed? Ten o'clock is my time for bed. It is not ten yet. Seven o'clock is your time for rising. Sure you're not when your pulse is beating at 115 to the minute. I wouldn't have let you feel it if I thought it would turn you into an agitator. <laughs> Dratted east wind makes more secures. If only we could be a done with winter, so poor lass could feel sunshine. If only she'd be as kind to herself as she is to others. See if you can't get her to stop flogging her sen on an on so martyr and bide where she is. Never child was so perfectious. Don't let her see you crying. Tabby. Tabby, I've never felt that the world was so dark. What can we do to comfort her? Uh, she'll not have none of it. She do tear me so to stand by and a dance peak. I think I'll go up onto the moors and see if I can find some heather. Maybe the sight and the moorland smell of it will cheer her. Nay, nay. You'll not find out of it this late in year. Going on towards Christmas time. Well, I must try, Tabby. There may be a spray lingering in some sheltered hollow, even if it's withered.
I'll send for a doctor. I'll see him now. Oh, thank you, Emily, dear. It will help us. You. I'll keep you company. Just going to fetch Dr. Wellhouse, Papa. Emily will see him now. Me. There is no more Emily in time or on earth now. Some sad comfort I take as I hear the wind blow and feel the cutting keenness of the frost in knowing that the elements bring her no more suffering. Her fever is quieted, her restlessness soothed, her deep hollow cough is hushed forever. We do not hear it in the night nor listen for it in the morning. We have not the conflict of the strangely strong spirit and the fragile frame before us. Relentless conflict. The dog keeper lay down at Emily's door and howled pitifully for many days. It was Christmas time. The sight of Anne's still but deep sorrow woke in Charlotte such a fear for her that she dared not falter. Somebody must cheer the rest. She wrote to her old school friend, Ellen Nussey, Could you now come to us for a few days? You will, I trust, find us tranquil. Try to come. I never so much needed the consolation of a friend's presence. It's no way to treat a guest, Miss Nussey, to send her in the kitchen. But when you were asked, Anne weren't near so sickly as these past few days. It weren't an odd thought she'd take so bad. But I love the kitchen. You know I do. Sixteen years ago, Tabby, when I paid my first visit, you didn't mind then if I sat here with you. <laughs> you were not then, Miss Nussy, but one of my children. Not a visiting lady. Little notion then we had what a road it would be. That was taking his time. I'm glad Mr. Bronte thought of sending to Leeds for him. There's hardly a better man in England, so I've heard, than Dr. Teal. And there was little. That was all as play acting. Wild. Terrible things. This was scared me with it. I run up to my brothers and I told him, William, you can go up to Mr. Bronte's. For those children, I'm sure, are all going mad and I don't stop in towns any longer, William. <laughs> when we got back to them, they only set up a great crack of laughing. 
giants, ten miles high, they said they were, <laughs> ruling a mighty nation. Has the doctor gone? Charlotte, what has he said? He says we must send you home. It's consumption of both lungs, very far advanced. There is nothing. Oh, my dear. We are vanishing now. We are vanishing. <laughs> Bronte. Well, you startled me, Mr. Nichols. How is your sister today? A little easier this morning. At least she says the pain in her side is less troublesome. Your father tells me you plan to go with her to Scarborough. She's so insistent that the sea and the air will do her good. But unless there's some improvement, I'm so afraid of taking her from home. If I might suggest, with your father's permission, I would gladly accompany you to make the journey alone. Miss Nassi has promised to be our companion, Mr. Nichols. Anything I can do, what you think of me as a friend? It has been hard to stand by and watch you suffering. You've shown such courage, such a steady trust in Providence. And I wanted you to know that someone is painfully aware of how admirably you have gone forward. I avoid looking forward or backward. This is not the time to dread or weep. Too often I feel like one crossing an abyss on a narrow plank. A glance around might quite unnerve. Stay with me, Charlotte. Show Miss Nassie the spa bridge. I shall be very happy alone. There's so much to see and take in. I'll be my own coachman. Is it all right for her to... Oh, a baby could drive him, miss. <laughs> Where'd she go, miss? I'm frisking her up. What is your name? Jack, miss. Well, Jack, next time you use the stick on her, think of it falling on your shoulders. Yes, miss. Have you seen that little dog? Barking at the phone as it runs up towards him. acting like King Canute. The 
never see you so still today. Room's only enough to factor the light. Almost too good to leave. Except that there's better to come. Charlotte, would it be easier for you at home? Should we go back? Is that what you would like, dearest? No. No. Unless it makes it harder for you. I should like to die here. These three days have been such good ones. We have never seen such a sunset, have we? As yesterday's. It was given us as a pledge. Don't be fearful for me. Wherever you are happiest. The tide has begun to turn. The sand has the sky in it where the sea's gone back. Cloudless blue sand. I feel a change. I have looked long enough now. I shall try. You give it to me. Dinner is on the table, Miss Bronte. buried at Scarborough. She had asked that this should be so. It was three weeks before Charlotte returned. I got home a little before eight o'clock, she wrote. All was clean and bright waiting for me. Papa and the servants were well and all received me with an affection which should have consoled. The dog seemed in a strange ecstasy. At former returns, they have always welcomed me warmly, but not in that strange, heart-touching way. I am certain they thought that as I was returned, my sisters were not far behind. I left Papa soon and went into the dining room. I shut the door. I tried to be glad that I was come home. I have always been glad before, except once. I felt that the house was all silent. The rooms were all empty. She went back to writing the book that for the past six months she had had no heart to go on with. The effort was a hard one at first, but by the end of August she was able to say, the book is finished, thank God. Oh, Miss Bronte, I've heard such news. Have you marvelled about? Please, ma'am, you've been and written two books, the grandest books that was ever heard of. My father read it to Sally Fax and Mr. Grange Mr. Thomas and Mr. Marsh at Bradford, and they're going to have a meeting at the Mechanics Institute to settle about getting the books. Oh, hold your tongue, Martha, and go and do the study before Mr. Bronte gets back from his walk. Please, ma'am, your father says now he understands why so many strangers came to church on Sunday. People are making great fools of themselves. Now, Martha, did you hear what I asked you to do? Yes, sir.
come in. Mr. Nichols, is something wrong? It may be wrong to speak, to say what I can no longer withhold from you, Miss Bonte. I had to make up my mind because what I have been suffering month after month has become impossible to endure. For more than a year, I have loved you. Deeply, deeply, Miss Bronte. I've tried to subdue my feelings. I've desperately tried and desperately failed. I felt if I did not speak to you, I should go mad. Is it possible for you to give me some hope? Have I angered you? You have not. No, you have not, Mr. Nichols. I can see. Well, I know what it has cost you to speak, and I feel scarcely deserving to, unhappy to be the cause of so much distress. I cannot help but be touched to the quick. But, Mr. Nichols, we are both far too disturbed to say any more. Please leave me. It's better that you should go. Did you speak of this to my father when you were with him? It was beyond my courage, Miss Bondi. Then I must. I promise you that you shall have your answer tomorrow. That's all I can say. Good night, Mr. Nichols. Is that Nichols only just gone? Yes, Papa. What's the matter with the man? Is he sickening for something? He was in a most exasperating mood. Couldn't keep his mind on any business for two minutes together. He has declared himself, Papa. He has what? He has asked me to marry him. In my house? He has the temerity to cross the threshold with such impertinence in his mind? He's less of a gentleman than I thought he was. If I had a notion of what he was about, I could have saved you such embarrassment. I hope you were blunt with him. Well, I told him I would give him an answer tomorrow after I had spoken with you. There can be no question in your mind. You could never entertain such effrontery for a moment as that mindless, self-opinionated, conceited jackanapes lost the last sense of proportion he ever had. Papa, you're being unjust. Unjust? Justice would throw him down the steps with his shoulders pay in his pocket. A witless, unimaginative, ineffective, bad... Mannered, tactless, nobody. Not even the vision to realize you're standing in the world of letters and society. It would be throwing yourself away. I should expect you, if you marry at all, to do it very differently. Very well, Papa. You shall have a distinct refusal tomorrow. Of course. Of course. There can be no question of that. You have too much good sense, my dear girl, for me to suppose anything different. Well, let's talk no more of this obnoxious subject. How is your new book progressing? I hope before long to hear that it's finished. Dear Nell, I am preparing to go to London this week. I find it quite necessary that I should go to superintend the press, as Mr. Smith seems quite determined not to let the printing go on till I come. Papa wants me to go too, to be out of the way, I suppose. And I am sorry for one other person whom nobody pities but me. Martha is bitter against him. John Brown says he should like to shoot him. They don't understand the nature of his feelings but I see now what they are. 
Mr. N is one of those who attach themselves to very few, whose sensations are close and deep, like an underground stream running strong but in a narrow channel. He continues restless and ill. Dear Nell, without loving him, I don't like to think of him suffering in solitude and wish him anywhere so that he were happier. He and Papa have never met or spoken yet. Yesterday was a strange sort of day at church. It seems as if I were to be punished for my doubts about the nature and truth of poor Mr. Nichols' regard. Having ventured on Whit Sunday to stop to the sacrament, I got a lesson not to be repeated. He struggled, faltered, then lost command over himself, stood before my eyes and in the sight of all the communicants, white, shaking, voiceless. Papa was not there, thank God. Joseph Redmond spoke some words to him. He made a great effort, but could only with difficulty whisper and falter through the service. I suppose he thought this would be the last time. He goes either this week or the next. You know what's happening over there in parlour? Mr. Nichols is taking leave of Master. He told my dad he was coming because he goes off at six o'clock in the morning. And we shan't be sorry not to have him blooming and sulking and not eating. Get meat. on with your work, girl. I wouldn't be surprised if we were set to cleaning room, so that Miss Bronte wouldn't have to be in it, so she wouldn't have to see him. You mind your business, Martha, and leave your betters to mind theirs. These are the deeds of the National School, Mr. Bronte. The keys I've left with John Brown. He tells me the man taking my place will be lodging there as I did. There's nothing more, I think, that I should remember. It only remains for me now. I want you to know that Whatever hard words have passed between us, I am very conscious of the invaluable work you have done in the parish. Indeed, you have accomplished very much. I am grateful. And I wish you well in your future work. Thank you. Good night, sir. Have I your permission? I'm going now. Goodbye, Tabitha. Goodbye, Martha. God be with you. Mr. Nichols, Mr. Nichols, this mustn't be. It hurts me that you're so unhappy. Please forgive me. It's an unpardonable exhibition. It's quite shameful. No, not shameful. I understand how hard it has been. You mustn't think I'm cruelly blind and indifferent to that. That's all I can say. It's little enough, I know, but truly meant. You're very good. Please go indoors. I won't say. Don't ask me to say. Godspeed, Mr. Nichols. The worst of pain does pass. It was towards the end of that summer that I first visited the parsonage. Charlotte had written to me, come to Haworth as soon as you can. The heath is in bloom now. 
I have waited and waited for its purple signal as the forerunner of your coming. I left Keithley in a car for Howarth, four miles off. Four tough, steep, scrambling miles. I turned up a narrow by-lane near the church, past the curate's lodging at the sexton's, past the schoolhouse, up to the parsonage yard door. In I went, half blown back by the wild vehemence of the wind which swept along the narrow gravel walk. I encountered a ruddy, tired-looking man of no great refinement, but I had no time to think of him. Miss Bronte had seen me from the window and welcomed me into her home. Father, Mrs. Gaskell. I hope the journey has not overtired you. Not in the least, Mr. Bronte. I travel well. From what my daughter has told me, oh, pray do sit down. And from my reading of your most interesting and commendable literary works, I think that you and Charlotte are congenial spirits. A little of each other's company might, under providence, be productive of pleasure and profit to you both. We are gregarious beings and cannot always be comfortable alone. No, indeed. Though there are times when one would wish to be. I think you arrived just as a visitor was leaving. He'd written to ask if he could call on the grounds that he was a patron of authors and of literature. Well, I replied that I would rather not see him, but he came all the same. I hope you showed him the door. He was a most agreeable, good-natured man. I insisted that Charlotte should talk to him. A famous person, as I think I have a right to call her, has a duty to those who would honour her. Well, I would rather be without individual patronage if it is to subject us to individual impertinence. I agree wholeheartedly. Oh? Oh? <laughs> You're a couple of proud mixes if that isn't equally impertinent. But I am proud to and enjoy Charlotte's fame. Have you noticed Richmond's portrait of her, Mrs. Gaskell? I have. And I like it. The expression is wonderfully good and lifelike, but I think it makes her look older than she really does. That's Tabitha's verdict too. But as she insists that the Duke of Wellington's portrait is a portrait of Papa, I'm afraid we can't allow too much weight to her opinions. I must leave you to your talk. I'm expecting Mr. Dorenzi to call Charlotte, though whether I can persuade him to rouse himself, I very much doubt. But they have sent me a curate, Mrs. Gaskell, whom I can scarcely call bone idle, for I doubt if he has a bone in his body. I am in my 77th year, you know, and must depend to some degree upon a curate's help. But more often, they only aggravate one's anxieties. Well, Papa, try not to let Mr. Dorenzi exasperate you. <laughs> that description of yours in Villette, of the effects of opium, it was exactly what I experienced when it was prescribed to me. Have you ever taken it? Not a grain in any shape, as far as I know. But when I have to describe anything that I haven't actually experienced, I think intently about it night after night before I fall asleep, until at last one morning I wake up with it all clear in my mind as though I'd actually had the experience. That is something I should never have enough imagination to do. It's the part of your genius that makes the smaller-minded of your critics say such foolish and hurtful things. Did I tell you about the young lady in London who introduced herself to me by saying, you and I have both written naughty books, Miss Bronte? 
I hope I withered her to her soul, if she has one. But I wither myself at literary parties. At Mr. Thackeray's, I could see that they were all expecting me to be entertaining and brilliant. They prefer agility to accuracy. But I found it more congenial to talk with the governess. Until at last, in a kind of desperation, Mrs. Brookfield sat down beside me and asked me if I liked London. And what did you say? Well, I told her the truth. I said yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> but after that, the party never recovered, and Mr. Thackeray crept out of the house and was never seen again. <laughs> <laughs> I am going up to my bed now. Good night. Good night, Mr. Bronte. Good night, Papa. Don't stay up too late. He has never quite lost the feeling, has he, that you are a child to be guided and ruled? Never quite. That, I suppose, is the way of a man's affection. I believe I'm a little frightened of him. Particularly when I think of that loaded pistol that you say he keeps in his pocket. Well, that's a habit of 40 years, since the days of the Luddite riots. He was very fearless. He took the part of the men against the masters, and vice versa, just as he thought fit and right. Still, I don't like to think of that deadly little pistol sitting down with us to breakfast, or, or kneeling down to prayers at night. I hope he isn't tempted to level it against the unsatisfactory Mr. Dorenzi. <laughs> <laughs> you needn't fear. <laughs> if he would only admit it, he's feeling the loss of Mr. Nichols. What has happened to that poor man? He's taken a curacy near Pontefract. H have you heard from him? Does he still hope on, in spite of everything? Yes, I have heard from him. Well, I tried to do as Papa would want, and I left six letters unanswered. But, my dear Mrs. Gaskell, it was like hearing an animal caught in a snare. I couldn't pretend not to hear. There is nothing more crushing than letters left repeatedly unanswered when a line would make life tolerable. But I must gather my courage and tell Papa what I'm doing. Tabby, the old servant who is upwards of 90 now, told me that since they were little bairns, Miss Bronte and Miss Emily and Miss Anne used to put away their sewing after prayers and walk all three, one after the other, round the table in the parlour till near 11 o'clock. Miss Emily walked as long as she could. And when she died, Miss Anne and Miss Bronte took it up. And now my heart aches to hear Miss Bronte walking, walking on alone. Mrs. Gaskell safely on her way. Yes, Papa. The house seems rather bereft. I think she was sorry to go. As I'm sure we both are to lose her. Oh, you're busy. Shall I leave what I have to say to another time? No, no, no. 
These are the criticisms of your last book, which I am pasting in for safekeeping. Do you know, the Literary Gazette is as good as any author could have the hope to look for? Yes, well, I ought to be. Indeed, I am very grateful, Father. I have something very different I want you to hear. It concerns Mr. Nichols. It hurts me to do anything in opposition to your will, Papa, but I felt I couldn't leave his letters forever unanswered when a few lines from me would ease his mind. He has written to you, knowing my objection. The man is not to be trusted. Then you must say the same of me, Papa. But sorry for him, I must be, and I wish you could be too. It's very unlike you to be unjust. Only think of what a devoted right hand he was to you during the eight years he was here. And when you compare him with Mr. Lorenzo... I might as well compare him with a sleepwalker. Nicholas was carrying out his duties. It does not give him the right to behave as he has. You mean to feel as he does? A man of any worth learns to keep his feelings under control. And you have replied to him. I'm sorry to hear it. Very unwise. It will only make him more persistent. It's not without cost to himself, Papa. He's been offered a very good living in the South and has rejected it. I'm only asking for an opportunity to become better acquainted. In January, he's staying with the Grants at Oxenhope. Now, when he's only a mile away, it would be quite inhuman to ignore him altogether. It is against my wish, against my wish altogether. Oh, he knows it. Hasn't he any respect for himself? He has constancy. At least you must grant him that. I am a grown woman, Papa, and I hope I have judgment. Do I have your permission to improve my knowledge of him? You have distressed me very much. I cannot fix my mind to pursue the matter at present. Here's Mr. Dorenzi coming to try your patience. Miss Bronte. I'm afraid I've kept you waiting a little on this raw day. You were exactly the time you promised. I was early and I... I kept warm with anticipation. Will you let me say how much it means to me to see you? To take your hand? You won't be offended. You've never said or done anything to offend me. You have been patient and forbearing in what I know to have been most trying circumstances. But I'm sure you realize there is still a great obstacle to any better friendship than we already know. I have one message for you. If you care to call tomorrow, Papa says that you may. I hardly like to ask you. He may not receive you very pleasantly. But the ice pack groans, you know, before it thaws. Miss Bronte, a lack of perseverance is not one of my feelings. You may wish I were less able in that respect. But however hard it may be, I can never dismiss you from my mind or my heart. There is a great deal you don't know about me, or whether our essential thoughts can ever be in sympathy. I have learned to respect you very much. My one concern is to effect a reconciliation between you and my father. Miss Bronte, you give me such courage. If you stay with the Grants again in April, I hope you will find yourself here under different, easier circumstances. That's all I can venture, but I believe it must be so. Enough for me. Enough for me. You are a man of forgiveness, Mr. Nichols. I value that with all my heart. April the 11th, 1854. Dear Ellen, 
Mr. Nichols came on Monday and was here all last week. The result of this is that Papa's consent is won. In fact, dear Ellen, I am what they call engaged. Mr. Nichols will return to the curacy of Howarth. I stipulated that I would not leave Papa. What seemed at one time impossible is now arranged, and Papa begins really to take pleasure in the prospect. I am still very calm, very inexpectant. What I taste of happiness is of the soberest order. I trust to love my husband. I am grateful for his tender love to me. I believe him to be an affectionate, a conscientious, a high-principled man. And if, with all this, I should yield to regrets that fine talents, congenial tastes and thoughts are not added, it seems to me I should be most presumptuous and thankless. The people here are very glad, especially the poor and old and very young, to all of whom he was kind, with a kindness that showed no flash at first, but left a very durable impression. He wishes the marriage to be in July. That seems very soon. He spoke of you with great kindness and said he hoped you would be at our wedding. I said I thought of having no other bridesmaid. I mean the marriage to be literally as quiet as possible. The wedding day was fixed for June the 29th. Her two friends, Miss Nussie and Miss Wooler, Charlotte's headmistress in the old days at Roe Head, arrived at Howarth Parsonage the day before. And the long summer's day was spent by Charlotte in arrangements for the morrow and for her father's comfort during her honeymoon in Ireland. By evening, all was finished. The trunk packed, the morning's breakfast arranged, the wedding dress laid out. You're so cool and collected, my dear Charlotte. Is there nothing of any moment we're going to take place tomorrow? Well, not. Except in determination. It wouldn't do for both the contracted parties to be sick with nerves. You know, a man is an amazing piece of mechanism when you realize the weakness in what he calls his strength. A month ago, I was thoroughly frightened by his looks. Well, he looked so wasted and strange. However, inquiry gradually relieved me. In the first place, he could give his ailment no name. It seems he was going to die or something like that. But I took heart on hearing this, which may seem paradoxical. It certainly does. Do you know, my dear Nell, if a person is going to die, they don't travel a distance of some 50 miles to tell you so. So having drawn in the horns of my sympathy, I heard that he had been to a doctor who told him he had no manner of complaint whatsoever except an overexcited mind. And I soon discovered that it was my business to rate him soundly, and he went on his way singularly better. Perfectly unreasonable on some points, though, as his fallible sex are not ashamed to be, groaning over the prospects of a few more weeks' bachelorhood as though it were an age of banishment or, or prison. Charlotte, that's not how I should expect a bride to be speaking of her husband. You make me quite concerned for poor Mr. Nichols. Oh, well, I... I shouldn't feel free to laugh at his weaknesses if he hadn't my affection and respect. I haven't yet found him to lose with greater knowledge. I make no grand discoveries, but occasionally I, I come across a quiet little nook of character which excites esteem. He is always reliable, truthful, faithful, affectionate, a little unbending, perhaps, but still persuadable. Charlotte, my dear, could you spare me a moment? I have something. I want to speak to you. Excuse my taking her from you, Miss Wooler. Miss Dossie. Yes, of course, Papa. My child, you must not let it disappoint you. I'm afraid there can be no question of my being in the church tomorrow. Oh, but and my dear, I rely upon your understanding. At my age, in my 78th year, one must expect. It could not be gone through with.
I should be here to welcome you on your return. Let us say no more. I shall go to my bed now. Good night, Miss Waller. Good night, Miss Nassé. Don't let Charlotte step too late. Good night, Mr. Fancy. Good night, my dearest. My dear daughter. are in a quandary. Why, Charlotte? Papa says he's not able to come to the church tomorrow. Not come to your wedding? But Charlotte, your father is to give you away. What does he say about that? It wasn't mentioned. Did he say why he'd suddenly come to this decision? Is he unwell? Well, I, I think he's ridden bravely up to the fence and found it even higher than he anticipated. Recently, he's shown an almost superstitious dislike of the marriage service. Well, a curate has to be found to do duty at weddings. But let us be practical. Who is to give me away if it's not to be Papa? Well, what does the rubric stipulate? A parent or a guardian, does it not? I have a prayer book here in my reticule. Oh, I've read the service over so often recently, but I didn't think to notice. Whereabouts does it come? Between confirmation and the visitation of the sick. It's a long way on. Then shall the priest say... Here, let me find it. Ah. The minister receiving the woman at her father's or friend's hand. Friends? You see, it says nothing about the sex of the friend. It can be anyone. Miss Wooler, will you? Will you give me away? But, my dear, of course I will. If you think it's quite as it should be. Well, I don't think it's quite as it should be, but that's not something we can often expect of life. And failing that, Miss Wooler, I'm very glad it is to be you. wedding had slipped abroad before the little party came out of the church and many old and humble friends were there seeing her look like a snowdrop as they say her dress was white embroidered muslin with a lace mantle and white bonnet trimmed with green ivy leaves which perhaps might suggest the resemblance to that pale wintry flower by the time the service was over mr. Bronte had recovered his spirits and was indomitably cheerful even when Charlotte was handed by her husband into the waiting carriage and they set off on the honeymoon journey to Ireland. We have another letter from Charlotte to keep us company. Oh. Hey, I've been fretting about her all morning. Her going off over torsion. With such a cold hanging on her. Now, Tabitha, you have forgotten. She told us how the aunt of Mr. Nichols, who brought him up, you know, nursed her with kindness and skill, and she was greatly better. Now, since then, they have toured a great deal of the Irish countryside, and Charlotte has had a very unpleasant adventure, which, with the mercy of Providence, she has come to no harm from. You know it's no Rita going so far. Oh, she has a great spark of courage. Let me read you what she's written. We have been to Killarney. We saw and went through the gap of Dunlow. A sudden glimpse of a very grim phantom came on us in the gap. The guide had warned me to alight from my horse as the path was now very broken and dangerous. I did not feel afraid and declined. 
We passed to the dangerous part. The horse trembled in every limb and slipped once, but did not fall. Soon after, she, it was a mare, she started and was very unruly for a minute. However, I kept my seat. My husband went to her head and led her. Suddenly, without any apparent cause, she seemed to go mad. Reared, lunged. I was thrown onto the stones right under her. Arthur, that is Mr. Nichols, did not see that I had fallen. He still held her. When my plight was seen, the struggling creature was let loose. I was lifted off the stones, neither bruised by the fall, nor touched by the mare's hoofs. Of course, the only feeling left was gratitude for more sakes than my own. The good Lord preserved her. Hey, but my heart was near stopping. I'll not be easy in my mind till Lassie's home. We haven't many days to wait. Oh, here is a note enclosed for you, Martha. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh. Dear Martha, I write to line to tell you that if all be well, we shall come home on Tuesday, August 1st at about 7 o'clock in the evening. Have things ready for tea and you had better have a little cold meat as well as we shall prob probably get no dinner and Mr. Nichols will want something. I hope you and Tabby have been and are well. I am in haste and can only bid goodbye for the present. Yours faithfully, CBN. Dear Nell, you would have been written to before now if I had not been very busy. Mary Taylor's brother's wife, Amelia, and the child came on Tuesday. Charlotte! Yes, dear? You did remember to ask Mrs. Brown if she'd help with the Sunday school tea? Yes, I did remember. Amelia is really a simpleton in some things, odd and unnatural. Did she say she could? Yes, she can, Arthur. Arthur was much out of patience with her, but she improved on him, I think. Oh, Charlotte, dear. Yes, dear? Remind me to ask old Soudan over to talk over the paddy I'm living. Uh, which day would do? Why not on Monday? Very well. Jot it down in the diary, will you? The child amused Papa very much, chattering away to him very funnily. His white hair took her fancy. She announced a decided preference for it over Arthur's black hair and coolly advised the latter to go to the barber and get his whiskers cut off. Papa says she speaks as I did when I was a child. Says the same odd, unexpected things. Oh, well, that job's finished. Charlotte. Yes, dear. I forgot to tell you how cheered old Greenwood was by your visit. He looks forward to your going again. Yes, I intend to. And so Charlotte, the wife, returned and the door of her home closed upon her married life. We, her loving friends, standing outside, caught occasional glimpses of brightness and gladness within. And we looked at each other and said, after a hard and long struggle, after many cares and many bitter sorrows, she is tasting happiness now. Those who saw her saw an outward change in her look, telling of inward things, and we thought and we hoped and we prophesied in our great love and reverence. What about our walk, my dearest? We'll miss the best of the morning if we don't hurry. Yes, well, I'll just scrawl an end to this and tell Ellen that you're impatient. Are you being any more cautious in the way that you write? 
Women think only of the trustworthiness of their friends and they forget that a letter may fall accidentally into any hand. Well, I don't think I've said anything very rash. You've written too freely about Amelia. This kind of letter is as dangerous as Lucifer matches. If Ellen wants to hear from you again, she must write to me promising to burn what you write to her. <laughs> Arthur. No wonder men's letters are so uninteresting and uncommunicative. I never quite knew what it was before that made them so. No, oh, I'm very serious. I can see you are, dear boy. And if she promises, will you pledge yourself not to censor what I write? Yes. If she does, you can write to each other whatever dangerous stuff you please. Now, have done with it and put on your bonnet. <laughs> set off, not intending to go far, but though wild and cloudy, it was fair in the morning. When they got about half a mile on the moors, Mr. Nichols suggested the idea of the waterfall. After the melted snow, he said it would be fine. Charlotte had often wished to see it in its winter power, so they walked on. It was fine indeed, a perfect torrent racing over the rocks, white and beautiful. It began to rain while they were watching it and they returned home under a streaming sky. Her friend and bridesmaid, Ellen, came to pay them a visit in October. I was to have gone also, but I allowed some little obstruction to intervene to my lasting regret. Then Christmas was upon us, and in the new year of 1855, Charlotte was attacked by sensations of perpetual nausea and ever-recurring faintness. When the doctor was sent for, he assigned a natural cause. A child was on the way. A little patience and all would go right. But the dreadful sickness increased and increased till the very sight of food occasioned nausea. She, I can't bear to see you, sir. She looks like a tiny bird in that great bed. I keep trying to cheer her up, sir, with the thought of the baby that's coming. She says she'll know she'll be glad sometime, but now she's so tired and weary. I uh, Bren would have starved on what she's eaten these last weeks. My dear, patient, constant Arthur. The tenderest nurse, kindest support, the best earthly comfort that any woman had. Oh, merciful father, do not ask her. I'm not going to die, am I? They will not separate us. We have been so happy. Mrs. Gaskell to write about her. Otherwise, all the falsities that are being written by people who never knew her will continue. I only say it is too personal and sacred to be rendered public. Good night, sir. We cannot keep her to ourselves. 
She is out of our care now. Good night, my son. I do not deny that I am somewhat eccentric. Had I been numbered amongst the calm, sedate, concentric men of the world, I should not have been as I now am. And I should, in all probability, never have had such children as mine have been. <laughs> 